As long as I can remember, I've been involved with art and had a love for horses. I pursued my studies in art at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. I never felt quite good enough as an artist and found myself compelled to follow my passion for horses. I've had a successful career as a dressage rider, trainer, and instructor for over 30 years. So, how does a dressage rider make the unlikely journey to becoming a digital filmmaker? When technology became consumer friendly, approximately four years ago, I got my first camcorder and started making promotional videos. Soon, I started to explore subject matter outside of those promotional videos. This was the first time that I found something that I was attracted to as much as riding. Now this is going to be difficult. I live on a farm, and it seemed natural to capture that world. This is where my exploration in experimental filmmaking started. I watched and absorbed the work of experimental filmmakers such as James Broughton, Maya Deren, and Stan Brakovich. One of the artists that impacted me during this experimental time was Mary Macon, an abstract painter who discovered filmmaking when her husband, Willard Moss, asked to film his project, Geography of a Body, in 1943, which was done in extreme close-up. To get these extreme close-ups, she used a magnifying glass taped to the lens of her camera. I found that to be an interesting idea, which I tried with my camcorder when filming summer. It worked very well. This is the video clip of the tiny mold flowers I captured using that magnifying glass. It was during my reading of Maya Darren I learned that she always storyboarded and she contributed her success to pre-planning. It was at this time I was an assistant instructor at a film program where it's taught you always storyboard, period. In my first packet, I wrote this confirms the idea that it's important that you should always plan out your films. My advisor's response was, I don't believe in shoulds. She explained that sometimes it's important to plan and sometimes it's a good idea to shoot everything and anything. I found her response informative, but it didn't really resonate with me until my second semester, when I had just finished reading Film Art and Introduction, where it was written, Directors Should Always Storyboard. I wrote that comment in my first packet. My advisor tactfully mentioned not all directors storyboard and pointed me to filmmakers such as David Cronenberg, Jim Jarmusch, and Werner Herzog who don't storyboard. In the book, Herzog on Herzog by Paul Cronin and Werner Herzog, Herzog says anyone who storyboards is a coward. Jim Jarmusch does not believe in storyboarding because he feels it takes away from spontaneity. In my G1 semester, I had written and produced a three and a half minute short that took four to five hours to film. I didn't storyboard. In this case, it probably would have been helpful if I had done some planning. In my G4 semester, I was part of a local production company as director of photography and editor. In this case, it did work out for the better not to storyboard because it gave room for spontaneity and exploration in cinematography, which brings me back to my G1 advisor stating she doesn't believe in shoulds. My lesson? It depends. This is very refreshing. I tend to be most comfortable working outside that of convention. This is how I work for over 30 years in dressage, rarely following the traditional rules. It was during my second semester that the techniques of French New Wave impacted my work, especially filmmakers such as Francois Truffaut for his techniques in freeze frames and leaving the viewer with an unresolved ending and Jean-Luc Godard for his discontinuity. Filmmaker Werner Herzog holds a special place for me. He has a great sense of play that can include leaving in mistakes. 
This is a new concept for me. I discovered that I emulated him in my documentary, Grow and Share. I became part of the documentary by allowing the viewer to hear a conversation off camera. Oh, that's going oh, that on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> that's going on YouTube. <laughs> I'm a woman. I was interested in women filmmakers and wanted to know what women had achieved. In my equestrian career, I worked and competed on an equal basis with men. And I wanted to find out if the same could be true as a filmmaker. Just as there's a difference between how a woman will ride a horse compared to a man. While it is to the independent film festivals where women have been drawn and received recognition, there was a limited number of women in mainstream Hollywood. In my continued research during my portfolio semester, I discovered women filmmakers in Hollywood had made up over 50% of the production activities by 1909. At the height of their activities between 1918 and 1922, women directed feature-length films, headed more than 20 production companies, wrote hundreds of produced screenplays, became the first agents and held positions as editors and heads of publicity departments. No country witnessed the huge number of women filmmakers than the U.S. did. However, no country experienced such a swift expulsion of women from filmmaking in the years to follow. Although many women retained their positions as screenwriters, it was a different story elsewhere on the lot. By the mid-1920s, female directors and producers, many of them who were critically and commercially successful, found themselves defined as unfit. Girls who wanted to become editor apprentices were discouraged. Female stars no longer started their own production companies by the sound era. Director Lois Weber advised young women to avoid filmmaking careers. Weber, in 1916, became Universal Studios' highest paid director. She was the only woman granted membership in the Motion Picture Directors Association. Director John Ford worked with Weber as her assistant before making his own films. The only female director that sustained a successful career in mainstream Hollywood was Dorothy Asner during the 1930s and 40s. Ida Lupino had some success in the 1950s. I was surprised by the new information, how fast they lost positions when executive control and financial legitimacy became paramount. Not until the 1970s would the numbers of women directing and producing feature films begin to increase in mainstream Hollywood, such as Barbara Streisand, Jodie Foster, and Catherine Bigelow, who directed The Hurt Locker 2009, which won the Academy Award for Best Picture. Agnes Varda's Gleaners and I was the first documentary that Susan saw that was not typically Hollywood mainstream. It was the first time she saw a documentary presented on a personal level. Susan learned as much about Varda as she did about gleaning. It was later that she learned about Herzog and how he too brought himself into his documentaries. It was a new approach to her. Her experience up to then had been Walt Disney and Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. With her new interest in documentaries, her advisor recommended reading Documentary, A History of the Nonfiction Film by Eric Barneau. It was the reading of this book in that that she became aware of the question of ethics. During that time, she learned that Walt Disney's 1958 documentary, White Wilderness, filmed in Alaska, depicted lemmings periodically committing mass suicide during migration by hurtling themselves off cliffs into the sea. Susan learned that the film crew brought lemmings that had been trapped elsewhere, then filmed them running around on a giant snow-covered turntable. They were then herded off the cliff and filmed while taking the dramatic plunge. The entire episode was staged by the Disney crew and wasn't even filmed in Alaska as credited. Disney earned an Academy Award. It was discredited two years later, but by then it was too late. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game is still explaining to people, even today, lemmings do not kill themselves. Susan's investigation in reading and viewing of documentary films gave her a lot of food for thought on how subjective a documentary film can be.
When I filmed this documentary, I had no idea what to expect. I met Bishop Vic Scott for the Raleigh Television Network when he needed someone to edit. He knew from our conversations that I was always looking for filming opportunities. He invited me to film the last night of a week-long youth summit. It wasn't until after the shooting that I learned I had experienced an apostolic event. As an outsider looking in, it was theatrical, emotional, and dramatic. I became curious and researched the origins. It's based on the Welsh revival of 1904-05 on the teaching of the Twelve Apostles. The mime in whiteface is the use of movements and gestures to win souls for Jesus Christ. What sounds like gibberish is talking in tongues. It's believed that speaking in tongues is God's language. As a filmmaker, I was attracted to the drama and the experience of high levels of emotion. In the beginning, I was a little hesitant because I felt I was invading a private space. I looked to the bishop for guidance. He was literally and specifically pointing me to film highly charged scenes. For this film, I don't believe I ethically crossed the line. Even though I was not literate in the culture, I believe I caught the essence of the event. And tell you, don't you give up? Don't you throw in the towel? Mm, there's a shape that's happening on your behalf. I see God doing something on your behalf within a 30-day period. You need to see God move. And I asked the apostle if she would lay her hands on her daughter in the name of Jesus because something is about to happen that's so great. I wish I could get some praises in this house.
My practicum was to be a personal piece called introspection. Up to now, I spent most of my time behind the camera. For this project, I was to engage with the camera as the subject as well as the maker, such as as I'm doing now. This is to be about the process rather than focusing on the finished product. It was during this meditative time, insecurities as an artist started to reappear similar to how I felt in New York City. I found myself pondering why was I putting myself back into a position where I didn't feel very talented. These were not questions for my advisor to answer. This was something that only I could answer. Though I asked myself questions about my insecurities during my practicum semester, they were not resolved at that time. However, it was good to have them arise. I had a film that I wanted to present to four film festivals, so I sent it out. I was rejected by three of them, and I was devastated. That just added to the feeling of not being talented. A few weeks later, I received in the mail a large envelope with an award of excellence. That had me thinking. Why would I expect filmmaking to be that much different than horse shows? You win some, you lose some. It was the following semester I found a book called Art and Fear by Ted Orland and David Bales that addressed these issues. Both Orland and Bale were artists coming from personal experience. It never dawned on me there can be times that an artist would be insecure and have doubts about the work they're doing. What an eye-opener. Art and Fear gave me practical tools to deal with the doubts that surfaced during my practicum. Come on. It was during my practicum semester that I read Stephen Johnstone's book, The Everyday, that focused on artists who use objects from everyday life to create their art, such as Martha Rosler. She used garage sales, a portrait of suburban society. She created a garage sale in an art gallery with unlikely items such as empty boxes, photos, cast off underwear, and even a notebook with a list of men's names. Using everyday life to create art resonated with me very much. It was during my fall semester I committed to a daily filming, anywhere from 30 seconds to 3 minutes. From these fragments of life, for each packet I wove together a story. This daily practice was titled The Everyday, after the book that had inspired me. It sharpened my eye and improved my camera skills. I became more aware of life around me. During my portfolio semester, I made the decision to continue with a daily practice similar to the everyday. Because of the intensity of my writing, time constraints made filming and editing impractical. I grabbed my still camera and started a new series titled Quotidian. I have found that this daily practice of catching fragments of life, a reminder to look at the commonplace and find creativity. My adventure at Goddard is coming to a close. But my journey continues every day.
It was the following semester that I found the book called Art and Fear by Ted Orland and David Bales that addressed these exact issues. Both Orland and Bales were artists coming from personal experience. It never dawned on me that there could be a t that, oh, shit. <laughs> God. <laughs> An artist who used objects from everyday life to con shit. <laughs> shit. <gasps> okay, ready? Ready. <laughs> God, if I get the giggles, we're screwed. <gasps> I knew it. God, I hate acting. <laughs>